Hello. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for Dr. Ford and the IHMC for inviting me. Um, I'm more than happy to be here. I'm honored to be here. I had the privilege of speaking at the IHMC in Pensacola last year and just enjoyed it. It is excellent. So when Dr. Ford asked me to speak here and he asked me what my topic was to be, I wasn't quite sure what to say. I thought what I had spoken of in last year was, was the most relevant. And then my wife with her, my wife Tracy with her uncommon sense said, well, why don't you talk about your knee replacement? It's like, ah, that's, that's perfect. Um, 42 years ago, I had had a devastating knee injury, a gymnastics injury, um, which changed the course of my life dramatically. And then three years ago, I had the total knee replacement, which also changed the course of my life dramatically, but in a completely different direction. When I found out just recently that there was three quarters of a million total knee replacements last year alone in America, 750,000 knee replacements, that's, that's a staggering number. And I can only imagine what that is worldwide in not counting hip replacements. Um, I had a very good result with my knee replacement. And as we'll see, it was an, it was an arduous journey to it. But I had a, it was a life-changing experience in a positive way. So I thought, I want to share this. I want to share my approach. I want to share my passion for the life that I got after my knee replacement. Because I went from being a cripple to being able to move like a human being again. I went from being in chronic pain to being pain-free. That's huge. That was huge. It completely changed my life. So hence the topic, life after total knee replacement, it's better than you think. Um, I don't know if my experience is typical or, or it's not. I've, I work with a lot of people that have knee replacements, and I'm, very, I'm getting good results with them. And you know, some, your mileage may vary. But the approach that I have is, is different and unique. So I want to talk about, talk about that. Um, so it's, this is easy for me in one sense because I'm very passionate about it. This is my story. So we're going to start where the story started at the beginning. That's me on your left, OK? When I was a little kid with a little, little dog in the cape, I didn't know about my knees or my elbows or my joints or about anything I except I wanted to be Superman, like a lot of kids that age. OK, so I got the cape. And I didn't know how I was going to be Superman until 1972 and I saw the, the Olympics and I saw the Japanese gymnasts. I said, these guys are Superman. I want to be that. So I started training in gymnastics and I did pretty well. I learned how to fly. And that was beyond amazing. That I was completely obsessed. I was going to go to the Olympics. I was convinced I was going to do everything necessary to go to the Olympics. And things were going really well until my senior year where I had a uh, two in knee injuries. I, I landed a trick, a full twisting back. I went to school in North Miami Beach, so I was a Florida boy. Um, landed and compressed the cartilage that I was in a cast for a month. And then a month later after that, doing the same skill, I had a devastating total dislocation of my knee. I um, mean, it, it was horrific. Um, in fact, I have somebody who, who was in the gym at the time who still talks about the screen. I'm not kidding. He Facebook talked to me on Facebook, and it, 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 it actually convinced him to become a gymnastic spotter. He became a great spotter because my coach actually missed the spot. Anyhow, I went to the doctor, who at the time was the team physician for the Miami Dolphins, um, who re-dislocated knee when he examined it. So I had two full dislocations in um, an hour. Um, that was bad. So they casted me. This was in 1974, so the state-of-the-art treatments, I mean, no ice, no, they put a full cast on it. The next day, they didn't take it that seriously. They scheduled surgery for Monday. I couldn't feel my foot. I went in. The doc said, OK, we're doing it now. Um, the doctor said it was the worst knee injury he'd ever seen. And this was a team physician for the Miami Dolphins. I came within you know, millimeters of tearing my femoral artery, uh, um, sorry, femoral nerve, which meant they would have cut my leg off. OK, so it was, it was bad. So this is, this is the day I got my cast off. I'm in the far on your left, with my only guy with my knee straight, because this is the cast. I got my cast off. Um, when they took the cast off, I just sobbed because it looked like two toothpicks stuck in a grapefruit. My knee did not resemble a knee. It was a big chunk of scar tissue with bones that completely atrophied. Those were my crutches, obviously. Um, and this was, this was a devastating thing for me because I had set my mind on it. But then I decided to go back to gymnastics. Yeah, OK. <laughs> 
I know, I know, my, my, my mom wasn't happy either. Okay, then we went to rehab, and this picture, you know, from Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's, and so that's nice, because she was worse than Nurse Ratchet. The rehab at the time consisted of her, because my knee was just one blob of scar tissue, her just, I sat, lay down, hit the wall and cried. And when my knee hit 90 degrees, I quit. I said, that's it. I don't care if I ever do anything else again. I can't do, I can't do this anymore. So I call it the no rehab. No mobility, no flexibility, no strength training, no rush, running, no soft tissue work, no nothing. Okay. So it was just break up the scar tissue, no strength training. So just wrapped it up and go train. So had ace bandage. Wrapped my knee up in an ace bandage. And then you can see on the picture on the, the right, it's still wrapped up in ace bandage. So I went back to school and went training, because at the time that was state of the art. Okay? And luckily, I had, the surgeon did a great job. He did a full re reconstruction. The, the knee, the ligament popped off. They took everything out, right? So at the time, my knee only bent 90 degrees, which is part of the story. It was 90 degrees for most of the rest of the 40 years. Um, so I wrapped it up a train. Uh, but oh, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. OK, so all right. So everything went fine. I, I did well. In, I, I went back. I succeeded. I won state championships. I got a full scholarship to the University of Iowa. Okay, I was team captain at the University of Iowa. I was Olympic bound. I had no doubt whatsoever. Then I re-dislocated I dislocated my shoulder on rings, and that was it. Because after that first rehab, I swore that if I never need another knee, another surgery from gymnastics, I'm quitting. So I went in. They looked at the shoulder. Now I need a shoulder replacement. That's another story. Um, they said, oh, you can, do, you can have a, a, a shoulder surgery. So I'm done. This is, I can't do this again. So I quit. But I was 21 years old. I was in the best shape of my life other than that. Couldn't use my upper body. So they told me, it's like, OK, there's a picture. They said the strength of the muscle legs to protect the knee. OK, so I did. I got into, well, I started off, I started running at the time. OK, so I couldn't use my upper body, so I started running. We'll go over here. I was race walking. That's actually in Gainesville, Florida. Race walkers get no respect. <laughs> I don't care. Gainesville's the track capital of the world, right? And I, get, I got jeered race walking. So I tried race walking. I wasn't going to go to the Olympics there. And I got back into powerlifting, and I got into bodybuilding. So I did eight years as a bodybuilder, and I did 13 years, I went into uh, powerlifting, which of course makes total sense with a bad knee and a bad shoulder at 35 years old. I've always said I'm tougher than I am smart. But I was, I was passionate. You know, I had this unfulfilled dream. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to be an elite athlete. I was driven. And at that time, my knee was relatively OK. So I trained. And then this was in, you know, we bought a gym. And in, in, we live in San Jose, so we bought a gym. And I trained with some really elite athletes, and it was wonderful. And then I started limping. I didn't really know what was going on at the time. I trained, because they said, you know, train, your, train the muscles, strengthen the muscles. I did that. But I started limping, and then I started limping worse, and I started limping worse. Um, and then I realized that this was going in the wrong direction. And then pretty soon after that, I hurt my back. And then, OK. Now I'm really, I'm check, I, I was checkmated. You know, I went into the doctor, and he said, well, we can, we can give you a knee replacement. Well, you know, your back is a herniation. That wasn't as bad. But my knee locked up also. Makes sense. The knee doesn't work. The gait's not right. Plus, I was lifting silly weights. Um, but they said, we can give you a knee replacement. It'll last 10 years. I was 40 years old at the time. It's like, 10 years? That's, I'm not doing this twice, because I had those horror m movies in my mind about the, the, the rehab, right? I can't do this 10 years. He says, well, just wait until you can't take the pain anymore. OK, so that's, that's what I did. And luckily, in 2001, I found the, um, the kettlebell, OK? But we all know the metaphors for strength. You're as young as your legs are strong. So, the legs are the first to go. It doesn't have a leg to stand on. Stand up for yourself. Stand and fight. Carry your own weight. What do you stand for? All these metaphors for strength all revolve around your ability to stand, hold your ground. That's another one. On your own two feet, stand tall. And this is my favorite one, a back of iron and legs that never quit. 
That was, uh, I got involved with kettlebells and, and um, Pavel Satsulin, and this was from a Russian general describing the, the qualities that a soldier needed to endure. It's like a back of iron and legs that never could. That became my mantra. That became my goal. So that was where I was trying to go. And then I found the kettlebell. And the kettlebell swing, surprisingly enough, worked wonders for my back, and it didn't require my knee to bend because it's a hinging motion where you're sitting back and standing up. It wasn't a squatting motion. So my knee, even though it didn't bend very well, okay, I could still, I could still stay fit. I could still stay strong. Okay, this, this also changed my life, okay, because I wasn't ready to quit. I wasn't ready to sit down. The other part of this story is that my father had multiple sclerosis, got multiple sclerosis when I was 14. And my dad basically got, got in bed and stayed there for 45 years. And I, that was not going to be me. So that was a big part of what drove me. It's like, I was not going to be that. So I found this something I could do. It didn't make my knee worse. It made my knee better. And then I became an instructor, and I got to travel the world. But I couldn't walk. You know, by the time Tracy and I would go somewhere, and we got to go all over, by the time I got to the airport gate, I was out of steps. You know, everybody's got their Fitbit, and they count their steps, you know. I had, I had two blocks of steps in me for the day. I get to the airport gate, I'm done. And then I got to go and teach you know, teach these courses that are 12-hour days, teaching and demonstrating for three days long, that's, that's how much my knee bent. That's my wife, Tracy, trying to stretch my knee out after I've been on my feet all this time, okay? So that was part of my life. And I just accepted it because I, I couldn't get a knee replacement. There's nothing to do. I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to get in a wheelchair. I was going to sit down. So I, I just sucked it up and on. But that was, that was the life. But standing and walking were just torture. So, okay, so the thing that did make life bearable was the beginnings of what I came to call body maintenance for myself. Foam rolling, stretching, and my favorite, the G-Power Pro Massager. <laughs> this is a therapy-grade vibration massager. What I realized is that I had to keep the soft tissue soft, okay? So when you think about it, everybody knows um, steak, right? It's soft, it's pliable, it's raw meat. That's what your tissues are supposed to resemble when they're not contracted. And then think about beef jerky. It's impliable, it's stiff, it's gritty, it doesn't bend, it snaps. That was my tissue on my leg. So I realized that if I could get the, the soft tissue soft, using the foam roller, rolling the tissues, my calves, everything. I used to spend, I'd work doing my training, my personal training, and then I would do two hours, two and a half hours a day of foam rolling and tissue because otherwise it couldn't work. And now it was not even a question of, you know, what do I want to be as an athlete? It was a question, I've got to make a living. I've got a family, I've got kids, I've got a mortgage, I've got to work. So I do my, my, do my training with personal training, and thank God I could still do the kettlebell, and it didn't hurt anything. It actually made me better. But I had to spend two hours a day on this, and that, so that's what I did. And this thing worked really well. So I went until I couldn't. That picture on the knee on, that, on your right, that's my knee the night before surgery. It doesn't, you know, it's funny because Tracy took the picture, and I saw a picture. I never looked at my knee. I couldn't stand to look at it. When I saw that picture, I'm like, oh my God, it's way worse than I thought it was. Because I never could look at it. Because there was nothing I could do about it. So what was to be done? So I just, looking at it now, I was like, wow. And then I had the brace. And the irony is, right before the surgery, um, my leg was actually feeling better. I, was, I had scheduled to go. I was supposed to go to Israel and Croatia and Denmark to teach. And, you know, I was always looking for that fix, that adjustment. You know, oh, I'm doing this. I can, I'll try to jury rig it somehow. And so when I scheduled all these teaching assignments, um, my knee was much better. Then all of a sudden, it wasn't. It had locked up in a way I could not get to adjust. adjust. And it wasn't just um, that it wasn't, was painful. It wouldn't bend at all. And I was like, I was really checkmated at that time. Now, at that time also... My former gymnastics coach, college, 
contacted me and said he had just had double knee replacements. And a month later, he was riding the bicycle for 30 minutes. I'm like, I know your knee was not that. I know that. I thought, oh, wow. So <laughs> I don't know how quickly we decided to, to do it, but it was what, it was like in a month? Yeah, less than a month. We decided, okay, I'm going to get this done because part of mine is like, okay, maybe I can still teach at these certs, right? Because maybe I could do that because Neil, Neil, my coach, re, re, um, rehabbed really fast. I'll make the decision afterwards, but I, I've got to get it done. So I found the doctor. I went in and we did, we did the surgery and then total knee replacement. Okay, so they get you up and walking the first day, you know, you, <laughs> okay, so that's, you know, the knee literally, you know, after they woke me up and then that's, you know, the first steps. And all this time, while I couldn't walk and I couldn't squat, I had like serious squat envy. Because I would see people, I really, no, I did, I had squat envy. Because people, I'd see people who were not fit, not strong, could squat down like a human being. I'm like, oh, I, I just, I just want to be able to feel what that feels like. Because that's a primal human pattern. That's not something we're supposed to not be able to do. You know, everybody, um, grandchildren, who has grandchildren under, you know, like five years old or little kids, they squat perfect. They squat like Olympic lifters, back straight, straight down. It's like, we don't have to teach them. They have to unlearn that. So that was like, okay, I need to get this done. So I had the knee, and this is, first week, first two weeks don't count, okay? If you have knee replacement, right? First two weeks don't count, because people, I, I deal with a lot of people that have had their knee replaced. I was like, how is it? I said, don't think about the first two weeks. It's going to suck, okay? It just is. It's going to hurt. And I had a particularly bad, Normal knee replacement time is about 90, I'm sorry, 60 minutes, 45 to 60 minutes. My surgery was three and a half hours. Because my doc, the first thing my surgeon came in, he goes, that's not a normal knee. <laughs> I mean, if you look back at the, that big chunk on my left knee, that was all arthritis. That was just one big, I mean, that thing was way out there. That was just arthritis. So normally they have GPS guided surgery now. It's just amazing. So they can set the, 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 the parameters perfectly. He couldn't use that on my, my lower half because it was so dysfunctional. And it was so much scar tissue, you had to cut away so much bone. So then I learned that during that, that rehab is like you don't need much sleep because I couldn't sleep. I'd sleep for two hours and then my foot swelled up so bad. My wife, who was an angel, just massage my, get up in the middle of the night, massage my foot. And then I realized the beginnings of what became my modality for, for rehab is walking felt great. That was the cool thing about the thing too, is like when they first got me up, because I had, for so, year, so many years, I mean 20 years, 15 years specifically, I had to think about every single step I took walking. There was no walking. There was like, is the foot, where do I put my foot? Because one position worked and one position didn't. Is my leg going to hold? Is my knee? Is like, ow. So I was like dragging that leg around. I mean, when I would go teach at certifications, I'm not going to leave that picture up. It's gross. Um, um, I, would, I would judge the success by how long it would take someone to ask me what was wrong with my leg. On a good certification, when I was teaching, if I got to the third day and somebody said, well, you're limping, man, what's wrong? I was like, oh, that's good. Somebody asked me on the first day, I was like, oh, I try to hide it, you know, I try to walk normal. That takes a lot of energy. People don't think about walking. Walking is a natural thing. It's like bang, 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 if you can walk. If you can't walk, it takes a ton of energy. And if walking is painful, it takes even more because everybody who has chronic pain knows people really don't want to hear about your chronic pain. You know, it's like maybe in the beginning, but day after day, it's like, how you feel? Ah, it hurts. It's like, oh yeah, okay, we know, I know, I know. And it's not, it's just normal because there's nothing they can do about it. So they, they don't, they feel badly, but there's really nothing they can do. So I tried to hide it and I tried to walk and I studied gait and I did everything I could. So then, let's see if we can do this here. This is, 
literally, I think, two days after my first steps. Yeah, I was like seriously happy. You know, this was like, I can, the main thing I was happy with, it didn't hurt. And then when they got me out of bed the first day, I'm like, how could this not hurt? It's going to, it's like, oh my God. I can wait bare on that leg and it didn't hurt. And then, then off to the races. Because I was so used to this horrible arthritic pain. I was like, okay, this is pretty good. I can work with this. But <laughs> my knee only still bent 90 degrees. Although in surgery, my doc told me that they, they had to test out the implant. So they bent it all the way to 150 degrees, the implant goes. I was so sore, my quads, it hadn't stretched that much in 20, 30 years. I thought something was wrong, it hurt so bad. So then, this is the basic, so then I was like, okay, you're gonna go to rehab, and you're gonna go to classic rehab. So I went to one session. And this is the mode, you know, this is not everybody's rehab, everybody's physical therapy, but this is the mode I've heard a lot, and the one they gave me, it was that they wanted me to work strength before mobility, they wanted me to work into and through the pain. It's a real common thing to hear people say, oh, I had to take my Percocet before I went to my PT session. That didn't make sense to me, okay? Forcing the range of motion. The thing they told me, you have six weeks to get all the range of motion you're gonna get. Well, that scared me, because I was at 85, 90 degrees. I was basically where I was before the surgery. Like, six weeks, you know, I was two weeks in and I could barely bend the thing. How am I gonna get all the range, I mean, I. I, the, the implant goes to 150 degrees. I want 150 degrees. I have squat envy, okay? So how long, can, and then bikes. Everybody, they put me on the bike. Well, if your knee, you need 100 degrees, 110 degrees to pedal the bike, when your knee bends 90, bike doesn't fit. So they said, raise the seat. Well, I had a previous back injury. My back started hurting. It's like, this is not gonna work. And they didn't have any suggestions, okay? Then they told me, don't squat. It's like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. What am I supposed to do to increase his leg press? It's like, well, mechanically, that's the same thing as don't squat. I said, okay, how do I sit on the toilet? What do you mean don't squat? That's bad for your knee. It's like, how can that be bad for my knee if the leg press is good? Forces, I mean, I've been in this thing a long time. I know the forces are basically the same or anything squatting is better. So that didn't make sense. So I ended up, I talked to my surgeon and said, listen, I gotta do my own rehab because they put me on this thing on the right, which is called a continuous passive motion machine. That hurt so bad because all it does is it bends your knee. It's automatic, it just bends your knee continuously. How long do they want me on there? Seven hours a day. You're, what do you mean I'm gonna sit for seven hours a day? Well, that brought back Nurse Ratchet in a heartbeat. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I mean, I used it for one day, I was like, I'm not doing it. And then the bike, that didn't work. So my knee's going off the side, my hip's coming off the chair. It's like, this isn't gonna work. So then, so I walked, because I couldn't sleep. Every time I got up, I started to walk. Walking felt good, it was loosening. So that now I could walk like a human being. I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna walk in full. Okay, I wanna walk as much as I could, because every step there is an alternation of contraction and relaxation. And that's the nice thing about walking is it's loosening the muscle as it's strengthening it. So I started, this is two weeks post rehab. This is the end of a three mile walk. Two weeks. So I was like super seriously pumped, okay? So, and I had the cane which I wasn't using, but I kept it with me. Okay, so then, this is two weeks. I think the first certification was like eight weeks after the surgery. I went back to work four weeks after three weeks of off. Because I, you know, I was not, once it got into my mind, I was not broken anymore. I was fixed. I'm healing. Every day I got better. Every day I got better. And that mindset was a real key thing. I was no longer broken. I had been broken. Now they fix me. And now every day I'm gonna get better. So I expected to get better. I expected more ability every day. I expected more function every day. And I, I didn't push it to, I mean, that was part of it. I didn't push it to pain because I'm trying to get out of pain, not into pain, right? So then I, had, then I, 
I realized, okay, I had been going downstairs sideways and backwards for 20 years. Because I couldn't, you need 110 degrees of knee flexion, so that's 90 degrees. You need about 110 degrees to walk down a stair like a human being. I didn't have that. So Frankfurt Airport, who's ever been to Frankfurt Airport? It's every stair, I mean, everything's a stair. I'm like, really, more stairs? I mean, I would break out in a cold set, sweat every time I saw a flight of stairs before the knee replacement. So this is my first attempts um, to go downstairs. It wasn't pretty, but it was fine. I had to relearn how to walk down the stairs. So one thing I realized very quickly is that even though my ankle was not injured, it hadn't bent right in 20, 25 years. So I not only did not have the motor pattern to walk down the stairs, I didn't have the ankle mobility. So like, <laughs> I was happy. It's a start, you know, it's a start. I felt like if I can do this, I'll do a little bit more, I'll do a little bit more, I'll do a little bit more. And it's true. So eight weeks later, I could run. It wasn't perfect, but I was overjoyed. So nine weeks later, I went to Croatia to teach my course, and Croatia translated English as every hill and stair in the world country. No, I'm not kidding. Every hill and stair in the world country. It was like, okay, I wanted a test, here's the test. So this is, you know, this is after teaching a 12 hour day course, and I wanted to do this. I was so hungry to be able to move and walk like a human being. This was just a joy. And then there's more stories about Croatia afterwards with the stairs, because they, they had one flight of stairs and the people there were like, you want stairs? We got a stair for you. It's like a 400 step stair. Huh? Well, it's four up and down, right? It was a eight, okay, even better, okay. So eight weeks later I did that, I went, I taught the CERT, I, and then I taught in Israel, I taught in uh, Croatia, and I taught in Denmark. And every day got better. So I worked the basics. Now, how did I do this, okay? The main thing I did was this supported squat, uh, squat, chair squat. So I would take the dining room chair, and I would hold the armrests, and I would just bend my knees. And I would just wait, and I would wait, and I'd wait, and the muscles just relaxed and gave out. And every day, it got a little bit better. Because they told me not to squat, which like I said, made absolutely no sense to me. It felt good, because that worked, that human primal pattern was key, and what I was doing, instead of somebody yanking on my knee, I was letting gravity work for me. Now, when your muscles are tight, what's holding it up is a thing called the stretch reflex. I waited the stretch reflex out. I just held, used my arms, and waited, 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 till my legs were too tired to hold me up, and they dropped, and they dropped, and they dropped. The other one was the same thing with a lunge. You know, I used the lunge pattern, which is a one-legged squat, essentially, and I'd start where I started, and I would just go down, and I would wait, and I'd wait, and I'd wait, and I'd wait, because it didn't hurt. Before, everything hurt. My knee didn't hurt. The knee was cobalt and polyethylene or polyurethane or whatever it was. It didn't hurt. There's nothing in there to hurt. What hurt was the tight, grisly, inelastic tissues. That's what hurt. So this whole program, I was obsessed with my knee range motion. I bought goniometers, which is like a big old protractor. Now there's a company that I'm working with. It's called Mover. They were supposed to send me a graphic. They didn't. It's M-U-V-R, which is a wearable goniometer, which all it means is it will measure the knee, knee flexion and extension. I would have killed to have this thing because I was obsessed with it. But you know when your knee's bending, <laughs> you know, and you know where it's not bending. So I did this supported chair squat, and I would hold it for two minutes. Same thing with lunge, and I would do this all throughout the day, little bit all throughout the day. And my focus was mobility and flexibility first, not strength. I was already strong enough. I had too much tension. I wanted less tension. I wanted range of motion. And I knew that the knee would bend. It was, it was, it's a mechanical device, it's metal. It's gonna bend, that's what it's made to do. And then the terminal bend, that was just to work the extension. But my focus was mobility and flexibility first. That made all the difference. Instead of focusing on isolation exercises and small, small muscles, I wanted to use these natural patterns and then 
I did crawling. I got on my hands and knees, and I did this rocking back and forth. And that's basically, let's see, get this pad in here. So right here, you're just rocking back and forth. So you can rock on your knees or rock on your feet. That's the advanced version. But this is basically a squat pattern out of gravity. So you can use your upper body. I do a lot of crawling. There's a really good um, program called Original Strength by uh, Jeff Newport and Tim Anderson. It's a book you can get. And it talks about the, using crawling, baby crawling, and then on, creeping in, on your knees to develop what's called reflexive stability. So when you crawl, if you think about childhood development, you look at babies and they lift their head, that works their core. When you crawl, it's the same thing. You activate your head and neck. In control of your head and neck, it activates your core, and it transfers upper body through lower body. So it's very powerful, and it's surprisingly hard stuff. But even just this rocking back and forth, it was just another way for me to stretch the leg, and I would do this all throughout the day. So, and again, building on normal range of motion and progressive walking and squatting. So I would hold on to the pole, and I would squat down. Now, now that I had a range of motion, I was, I was past the chair, I'd hold onto a post and I'd squat down. And then I started walking every, because now I could walk. So I started walking laps. That's the park right around my house. And I started walking laps every Sunday. And I started with a backpack. We call it rucking now. So I'd start off with five pounds in the backpack. And every lap, I still do it, I'd grab hold of the post and I'd squat all the way down and I'd hold it and let again gravity work for me and tire out the muscles. So there's 50 pounds in the backpack. So now, every Sunday, I walk two hours with a 50-pound backpack, and I do 10 sets of isometric hold squats, and it's just become part of my regimen. So that's where I started in the beginning, and that's, that's where I'm doing now, and I still keep it up. And the range of motion continues to increase, as, you, as you'll see. But the progressive walking, and that's the thing, too, is like people say they walk. If you treat your walking, it's all training is training. It's progressive. If you can, your body will adapt. If your body is a 10 horsepower body and you put an 11 horsepower load on it, it becomes an 11 horsepower body. That's unique. If you put a 20 horsepower load on it, you break it. But it's small, sequential, progressive increases in load. Your body is that miraculous thing that will adapt and in both directions. So if you have an 11 horsepower body and you only put an 8 horsepower load on it, pretty soon it's an 8 horsepower body. So that was my mindset. Okay, new knees, devices that last 30 years, not 10. Okay, I figure I was 56 when I had it, 86. By the time they're 86, Ken and his guys will have some bionic thing that'll just, you know, they'll put some stem cell in there, bang, I'll have a, grow a whole new knee. Knees, I'm counting on you, Ken. Shoulders next. Um, the knees that bend 150 degrees, this is huge. The old knees only bent 110 degrees. So. And people say, well, why do you need to squat? It's like a squatting is like walking. It's a primal human pattern. It's, and we'll go into that. It's crucial. GPS got its surgery. And overall, better tread on the tires. Okay? My surgeon basically said, 30 years, 30,000 miles, whichever comes first. So I was like, okay, 30 years. I'm trying. They told me not to run and jump. Those are the two things. So I did that run. I don't run unless I have to run. You know, if, before, if I had to run across the street to get out of the way of a car or run after something, I couldn't. That's really unempowering to feel that unable. So that's my knee. I love my knee. OK, so <laughs> you can see here, this thing, that's the carpet tack from my original surgery. So my ligament, that's where they reattached the ligament. It rolled all the way down here. They brought it up and just stuck the carpet tack in. Um, and <laughs> They said they left it in. There's no reason to pull it out, but it's like it's odd. Um, and then if you can see here the difference in height of the plateau here, that's my tibial plateau. They had to take off so much of that inner other part of that bone. They had to literally jury rig the device. Thank goodness I had a great surgeon. But I mean, they had to make this, and this is the other side, and there's this staple up there. So it was like I said, it was a three and a half hour operation. Thank. He's like an artist, okay? So, okay, so the foundations of my approach to the, the knee rehab, walking is the main thing. 
When I was in pain after the surgery, I walked and I walked and it just loosened everything up. Every time I tried to do these really intense leg presses or leg exercises, I got tighter. I was trying to get looser, squatting. And again, we're not talking about barbell squatting. We're not talking about loaded squatting. We're talking about sitting down on a chair, sitting down on a cushion, sitting on the toilet, basic, and then hinging. So hinging is the opposite of squatting where your hips are going back like you're going to pick something up off the floor. I got very good at hinging because I couldn't squat. My knee wouldn't move forward. In a squat, the knees move forward as the hips go down. In a hinge, the hips move back and the knees don't move. So that's why the kettlebell swing works so well for me because the knees never move forward. It's a hinge pattern. Tissue quality work. This is huge and this is neglected. I, I don't understand. There's a disconnect with a lot of physicians. It's not all and I'm not, no disrespect, I love my doc, right? There's a disconnect that muscles attach to bones. That's not taken into account across the board. Okay, why is my knee hurt? Well, your, your, the muscle, the central quadricep muscle, the rec fem is tight because you sit all day like this and it inha inhibits your kneecap and your kneecap is supposed to slide and glide and it doesn't. So when you bend your knee, your knee hurts. So the simplest explanation is usually the most correct one. So this muscle which is attached to that kneecap is too tight. Loosen this, your knee moves. You're gonna feel better, but rarely, if ever, do I ever hear that from docs, okay? Emphasis on mobility and conditioning over strength. The walking, because every step, we'll see there's, a, there's a, a slide. You're in a one foot, you're in a stance phase, a support phase, that's strengthening. Every single step, you do thousands of steps very easily. Daily practice. You know, if you go to your PT and you do their thing and you go PT once or twice a week, it's not gonna work. You gotta, you, you've gotta do this. Okay, and passion for the result. I wanted this. I wanted to move again. I, I'd spent enough time as a cripple. I was done with that. And don't rush into the pain. Pain makes you tighter. You not you want again focus on the mobility before the uh, and mobility over strength because the mobility is strength. If you can't bend your elbow all the way and you strengthen this range of motion not doing you good. If you can bend that elbow all the way, you will develop strength in that range of motion and that's first. That comes first. So that, that was my other goal, SESA. Okay, so this picture on the left was two months before that picture. So this is me at work. This is what I'll do is I'll sit in this position while I'm working with my clients. This is a miracle to me. You know, this is a miracle to me because I would see people do that and it's like, oh, I want to be able to do that. It looks so easy. And it is if you have that range of motion. And this is nothing more than daily practice, soft tissue work, and letting this happen. Okay. So the picture on the left was in, that was probably 2014 and that was, you know, a couple months ago. And that was my goal. I'd go in all the time and I'd like try to measure. Is it touching my glutes? Is it touching my glutes? And no, it's not. It's like, how far? It's like, oh man. And then one day it just happened. And all that was, was just the release of the tight quadricep muscles that let the, the, the knee bend as much as the device would allow. And that's at the start. I was, believe me, I was super happy with the picture on the left. Okay, so Salvatore Ambulando. It is solved by walking around. Walk, we are the best walkers on the planet, okay? Every animal in the world can outrun us, nothing can outwalk us. We are meant to walk. And if you look back, and I had some other slides that I, I took out, but if you look back in history, some of our greatest philosophers and thinkers were walked all the time. The Socratic method, Socrates, he walked around. John Muir, Teddy Roosevelt, it is solved by walk around. So this is that 800 step thing in Croatia. And I wasn't gonna do it. I was just gonna go down. And my friend says, look, you go down and I'll pick you up. I said, okay. And then I saw this lady come back and she's got a cane. I don't know how old she is. She's bent over and she's walking up. I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm doing the whole thing. <laughs> no, it's true. It's like, I saw her, I'm like, if she can do it, I can do it. Because everybody there walks, whether they've got a cane or because the, there's nothing else to do. There's no, there's hills and stairs everywhere. So it is solved by walking around. My mind only works with my legs. I can only meditate when I am walking. When I stop, I cease to think. 
My mind only works with my legs. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Walkers have a great history. Thinkers have a great history of walking. David Thoreau. I mean, it's just, it's so easy. Whitman, all these guys, they meditated when they walked because it's natural, it's easy, you can forget yourself. It's not like running. I mean, running's great. I was a runner. I did ultra marathons. I ran 50 miles. It's great. I love it. It's really jarring. But walking, most people will get all kinds of benefits from just walking. So gait, it's a primal pattern. So the stance phase and the swing phase. Okay, most people, I work with people every day and I have, I've been a personal trainer now really since 1979, full time since 98. Most people don't know how to walk right. Nobody practices walking. Their arms don't walk, their arms don't. I tell this joke, people don't usually get it. Does anybody, does anybody watch Seinfeld? Okay, you ever see the episode with a woman who didn't move her arms? It's funny, but it's true. It's like you, you'll watch, you start watching people, because I watch people for a living. Right? I watch them move. You see a lot of people never move their arms. If you don't move your arms when you walk, your back's going to hurt. So if your back hurts and you don't have a really good gait pattern in your walking, your back's going to hurt worse. So this simple basic act that we've gotten so far away from is crucial. So you ask people to walk in place, right? I do this with all my clients. And the first thing I see is this. I swear, it's like, which arm? That's where you get crawling. You get crawling. So it's like this contralateral gait pattern. The shoulders have to move. And then some people will walk and their arms will go like this, but their shoulders won't rotate. Whenever you see somebody, like you see actors, and they, work, they look really athletic and they look really cool, watch their shoulders. Their shoulders always move. Their shoulders move the arms. It's not the arms move the shoulders. The shoulders move the arms because it's this rotational pattern. We think of it's a really simple thing, but if you break it down, it gets really complicated to do it well. So, gait, it's more than, it's crucial. The opposite of standing is not sitting. The opposite of standing is squatting, okay? So there's a little two-year-old, feet close together, feet straight, squatting straight down, not even thinking about it. I don't know how old she is, but that's a deep squat. That's how most of the world works does their daily whatever, cooking, working in that squat pattern, because that is the human chair. This is not the chair, that's the chair. A chair puts you in a half squat position, which tightens up everything. Your ankles, your knees, your hips, your back, everything, those deep hip rotators, that's what we're supposed to do. And people say, well, I can't do it. You can learn to do it if you want to. It's just progressive, but I love this. <laughs> Every chance I get a chance, I'm sitting down, I'm squatting. Huh? Sure. I mean, I can't squat that deep, but, you know, get down. And you can squat on your toes, you know. Okay. It's close. I still, you know, I got a ways to go. So, I'm pretty happy, though. So, Bend your knees, your hips, your ankles as often as possible. Okay, people think, I don't want to hurt it. It's metal, you're not going to hurt it. Okay, I'm not talking, you know, three weeks afterwards. I'm talking once you're healed. Once the bone's knit, once everything's set, once you get your okay from your doc, practice bending. Bend your knees, bend your ankles, bend your hips. And it's not just about your knees. Your ankles and your hips have to be supple. It's all connected, upstream and downstream. Okay, these are not high-end skills. These are really basic skills. It's high-end if you can't do it. But these are the things that most people need to practice. Okay, and the new longevity test. The ability to get down on the ground and come off the ground with as little support as possible. Now, I'm not talking about the funky party trick where you cross your ankles and squat down. That's a party trick. I'm talking about being able to, you know, get down on the floor, you know, get on your hands and knees and get up off the floor with as little support. Because falls, as everybody knows or should knows, are the leading cause of death due to injury over 65. Think about that. The leading cause of death due to injury. And 1% of all deaths of people over 65 are due to falls every year. 1%, that's like 12,600 falls a year. 
I mean, from, from deaths, from falling. And a lot of that is people are not comfortable getting on the ground, okay? Being able to smoothly and easily bend your knees, hips, and ankles is crucial to getting on and off the floor. You want to sit on the ground and play with your grandkids, okay? You want to get on the ground and just stretch, okay? And it's a skill. If you never practice, it's going to be hard. So if you lose your balance and you're terrified of the ground, you're going to crash hard. Now, most of my clients are between 50 and 80, okay? And I've got a lot of clients that just turned 70, and a couple of them have just fallen recently a couple times. They're fine. She tripped, she caught her toe, landed essentially in a push-up position, and it was a fall. She scraped, but she didn't hurt anything because she was strong enough. Now, she, she clipped her toe because she, her gait is she doesn't land on her heels. She shuffles. So when you see people walk and they're a heel-toe, if you can't land with your toe up and transfer your weight, the chances of falling are greatly enhanced because you're going to trip over something. You've got to be able to pick up your foot. That's a mobility and a flexibility thing. All right, and this also builds tons of functional strength and ability in the, in the real world in your whole body. Your shoulders, your upper body, your core, your back, everything, your neck, to be able to just get on the floor and get up. Get on the floor and get up. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy until you do it on a regular basis. And then it's nothing, and it should be nothing. Okay, so the un unexpected benefits of the knee replace. My energy went up, I don't know, a million percent, maybe more. I mean, because pain management is so debilitating. You know, I was like seriously cranky, right, <laughs> most of the time. Because I was in pain. And you're trying not to show it. So you're like, all this energy. So once the knee was done, it's like my energy levels went through the roof. Once I could walk, because I couldn't walk, I couldn't swim, I couldn't ride a bike. I couldn't do any conditioning other than the kettlebell swing, which is great, but it's not the same as being able to walk five miles, okay? My energy went crazy. My back injury was a direct result of this imbalance between my knee and my hip, because you're gonna favor it regardless. I mean, Ron, I did a session with Ron at uh, Mountain, Mountain River this morning on kettlebell training, and he was like noticing, like, I have this in my, one of my spinal erectors is much bigger than the other, and that was directly a result of me having this corkscrew in my body for so many years where one side was working, I have scoliosis also, but one side was working so much harder and that, that kind of set itself in cement. Now it's slowly unwinding. So this total realignment of the body where for me the goal is square, plumb, and neutral. Everything's square, plumb, and you look at all these structures, right? If any of these supported structures were not vertical, you wouldn't want to be sitting under this roof. And it's the same thing with your body in space, because you're 33 pounds per square inch of gravity, right? It's constantly doing this to you. You need to be strong enough to oppose gravity. Serious reduction in overall body pain. So I went from being in total chronic pain all the time to not in pain. That's like all I want for Christmas, right? <laughs> I want to be out of pain. Moving like a human, improvement in mood. So conclusions, don't wait too long. Now, I, I can't say anybody, I've talked to a bunch of people today, actually, that are basically candidates, and everybody says, well, I, I don't want to do it too early, okay? What I found out with my knee was that you don't want to wait till you lose too much good bone. Only your doctor will tell you, but if you lose too much good bone, it's going to make your knee replacement or your hip replacement that much harder, okay? And you want to be as fit as possible before surgery. Now, that gets tricky. Because if you have a bad knee, everything hurts. It's really hard. But again, that's why I like kettlebell swings so much. Walking and squatting are your friends. If I just did nothing but that, even body weight squatting, I would be so far ahead of the game. Strength endurance is more important than what you can press for a heavy weight. Okay? Be prepared to work hard after formal physical therapy is over. That's why what I've heard is people, the physical therapists tell patients you only got six weeks because they know for the most part is after your six weeks with them, you're never going to do anything else again. And that's for the most part that I've seen. Once people get out of PT, they're done. So they try to get as much out of that knee as possible, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not the best strategy. Learn to do your own body maintenance. And what I mean by that is the foam rolling, the stretching, the, the vibration massage. Keep the soft tissue soft. Mobility, flex, flexibility, and suppleness are the keys. So remember, <laughs> that's Atlas, okay? 
your knee is no longer an bionic, use it, enjoy it. So last, that was last year at the IHMC in Pensacola. We got to meet Atlas and what was Valkyrie? The other one. So that was great. So I, came, I saw that, it's like, that's how I see myself now. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this greatly. And um, I'm almost right on time now. Yeah, that's a miracle. So questions? I, I wonder if swimming can help. It, it'll definitely help in terms of conditioning, especially pre. I don't see it as doing a lot specifically for your leg, your knee. It certainly won't hurt. And especially pre-knee um, pre replacement, it'll be great for getting you fit and your strength and your cardiovascular ability. And it depends how you swim. You can use fins. There's a lot of ways to use different strokes to increase quadricep strength, especially with fins. But there's be a difference before and after. It wouldn't be my first choice for after. In a, not as a substitute for walking. In a, as a supplement, sure, but not as a substitute. Yes, sir? Uh, what would be good or bad to do with a um, small uh, meniscus tear in your knee? Yeah, I'm not qualified to answer that. You know, there's a lot of controversy over meniscus operations anymore. Um, I've had people who had them taken out and, and surgery, I mean, stapled down, do great. I've had people who don't do anything and do great. So, I mean, I would never make a call on that. But again, I've had, I, I will say this, I've had people that were scheduled for surgery that did the body maintenance, their legs were locked up and they you know, used the foam roller and did stretching and they didn't go to surgery. So I've had at least four people that were literally scheduled for surgery, went into the dock right after we did the work and didn't need the surgery. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Again, but I'm differentiating between exercise and, and, and tissue work, body work, so self-massage. So exercise strengthening, that may or may not help. I know that keeping soft tissue soft is cru crucial for all joints. We're good? When I had my knee done, they told me not to bend on my knees at Not all. to kneel. Not to kneel. Right. That, yeah, they, they told me to. Um, and I've never done it. Well, you know, when I kneel, so when I'm on my knees, I'm not on my kneecap. I'm on the front. I don't know if you can see, but I'm not, I'm not on here, although I can do that. When I'm kneeling, I'm on the front side of my knee. Um, well, that's what they tell most people, and most of the people that I've worked with, I, I never push it. I would never, I'm, like I said, I'm not a doctor. I'm not qualified to make those calls. I know what I've done. And a lot of the, the clients that I've worked with found out that they could, knee, could kneel. I never really got a good explanation of why not to kneel. I mean, I can understand direct pressure on the kneecap, but if you're kneeling and on the front side of the shin, I, I never really got a good answer why not to. It's, it's never been anything but... Um, the other thing is I've also had hip replacements too, mm -hmm. so maybe that's why. And the gentleman who asked about the meniscus, mm -hmm. I had mine done about three years ago. It's a miracle. Okay, there you go, there you go. And the hip replacements, my, my training partner is a, has double hip replacement, double knee replacement. Um, and he trains, he's 64 years old. And he, unfortunately, he has the old style knee implant, so it doesn't bend as well. Um, but he does everything I do with training and he's, he, he moves 100% better than he ever did. Especially, again, the most important thing is the mobility and flexibility training. knee surgery mm -hmm. three years ago double replacements they still hurt every day of my life I can't kneel I walk with a cane mm -hmm. do you think continue to walk or what might help me the most the, 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 I have a like the lady that I trained that had double knee replacements um, she had a lot of pain from the tight quads and so every time she would come see me, she sees me once a week, and I'd, I'd do the massage, the massage tool on her thighs, and her thighs would light up like a Christmas tree. So she never did enough work to get the soft tissue soft. So if the soft tissue is tight and, and restrictive and pulling on those joints, it's going to hurt. You know, if you have a cramp in your upper back or your, your posture or such, and you're going to have pain, muscular pain, musculoskeletal pain. 
So I, I don't know that that's the case, but I, that's my first, I mean, walking, I would not advocate anything that makes the pain worse, except for the massage. So you might find, because that's going to be, you know, when you do some massage, it, it's touchy at first. But that's what I would say. I'd get in there and get a good massage tool, a percussion massager, and spend a lot of time softening that up, that tissue. And then just like they had on the, the, the hill slides where you're pulling your knee back and stretching it, you could do that in bed, pull your knee in, massage it, pull your knee in, and get that tissue soft. And I would bet a lot that if you got the tissue truly soft, your pain would diminish greatly. And then you can walk without pain. But that's what I've seen, but everybody's different. We have time for one more question. We're good? Good? I had, I tore my meniscus twice. Mm -hmm. The first time I was in probably my early 40s and I just kind of kept on. I've always been a walker mm -hmm. and I've always used the massage tools. Oh, great. However, when I tore it again <laughs> several years ago, I had to go in and have it done. But two weeks later, I was in the car and driving to New England. Yeah. And I think it's all because well, of that. Well, you know, it's like anatomical things. I mean, once the joints are broken, once the tissues, like especially if you have, I was talking to one of the gentlemen who um, interviewed me later, it's like once you're bone on bone, it ain't going to get better. You know, once you take the protective covering off, it's just going to get worse. There, it, unless you're going to regrow cartilage, there's all kinds of things one can work on in terms of gait mechanics and position and mobility. You look at your ankles, you look at your hips. Are you, you know, have somebody do a gait analysis. Is your gait square? Not you, but I'm saying in general. Are you walking correctly? Because you, once you have pain, people start compensating. And even after the pain's gone, you still compensate. You don't know it. So you have to break. I mean, I had to relearn how to walk, literally, you saw, from, from the beginning. So it's like you have to pay attention to that. And if you can get that squared away, literally squared away, it's going to make a huge difference. But the massage tools, I don't know why people don't advocate that more. It, it saved my life before my knee replacement. It allowed me to function as best as I, best as I could. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.